is an example of our gym bank provides us every year. On one side, we give them our best elite material, which are the best variety, the most productive one. They cross them to the wide relative and land races, and they produce for us F2 crosses, which I go and I select. So they produce some hundreds every year. This is, for instance, is the same cross. Um, and in this case, you can see in, in one side, it came out pretty tall. On the other side, it came down quite short with rather large spike. This is an excellent example of the variability we get from the gym bank. And at that point, me and my team can go in, spray some of these spikes red, which means we have selected them. We will harvest only these. We'll put them together. We'll try to see in the long run if we can make them a variety or something very useful for breeding, maybe. We don't know what they have inside. They may have great new genes that we don't know of. They might not have anything. So our job is basically just to give them a chance and see if there's anything there that we can use. Here in ICRIZ, we are maintaining 11 crops, six of the mandate crops that ICRIZ is working with, sorghum, pear millet, finger millet, chickpea, pigeon pea and groundnut, and other five small millets. Our objective is to maintain the diversity of this material, of these crops, and provide this material to all the users uh, inside ACRZ and outside ACRZ and also outside India. Actually, some accessions which, the, uh, which we are collected as a land race from the farmer's field, now it is not there. So it's like a backup, even for the farmer's community, farming community. In addition to maintaining, we also multiply and distribute to users. It could be researcher or student or farmers or NGO for distributing the seed. So the, in a way, uh, when we distribute, we make sure what we are distributing to the farmers or end the users are uh, the appropriate uh, genotypes or accessions depends on their uh, agroecology where they are going to be used. I believe that the Simi Gene Bank is quite unique because we also store land races, so old varieties, which has also a cultural importance. So they are, they are linked with local population and so they, are, they, are, they have also a cultural heritage. So if one day this particular human population lose this land race, we can repatriate and give them back some of their cultural heritage. Greetings everyone, I'm Yanni Van Veen, and on behalf of the GeneBank platform and the Crop Trust, thank you for joining us for today's Grow webinar. It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Professor Douglas Dolan from Oxford University, Douglas holds a Bachelor of Arts degree from Harvard University and a Master's in International Relations from Yale University. He received his PhD in economics from the University of Minnesota in 1996. Among other professional activities from 2012 to 2017, he chaired the standing panel on impact assessment of the CGIR and served on the CGIR Independent Science and Partnership Council. He has also served on the research advisory group of the former UK Department for International Development. Douglas is currently Professor of Development Economics at Oxford University with particular interest in agricultural productivity and technology. His interest in gene banks and the uses of genetic resources in agriculture reflect a broader interest in the processes of agricultural research, including the flows of genetic materials to breeding programs. This month's growth topic is seed morgues, and the title of the presentation today is Who Needs Seeds? New Genetic Technologies and Old Seed Morgues. Welcome, Douglas. Thank you so much, Yanni, and thanks for the introduction. I'm going to offer a couple of apologies right at the beginning. As you can probably hear, I seem to have lost my voice somewhere in the last week or two, um, possibly from giving too many lectures while masked. Um, but I'm really delighted to be a part of the webinar series. I'm gonna go ahead and share some slides and uh, also give a couple of disclaimers. So disclaimers are, first of all, obviously I come to this topic as an economist rather than as anyone with technical knowledge or understanding of genetics. And my title is a bit provocative. I've uh, asked the question, who needs seeds? And let me just go ahead and jump in. Um, as a starting point, you could ask the question, I think reasonably in 2021, why bother storing seeds? They are 
dirty and messy things. They're small, they're fiddly to handle. The, they have a tendency to spoil. What this means for gene banks is that the processes of, of regeneration and reproduction are complicated. Long-term storage is of course costly and uncertain, particularly given that you have to regrow seeds periodically. And I think increasingly the question arises that users are interested in genomic information. They're not interested so much in the seeds themselves, but they're interested in the underlying genetic sequences, perhaps linked to data from characterization and evaluation, which still for the most part are taking place through physical trials. But I think there are questions here. And I think the other piece is we see frequently with the gene banks and the CGIR gene banks that use patterns, although use in many dimensions has increased, it's also true that there's not as much direct use of material from gene banks in breeding programs as you might imagine at first glance. So it's true that there's some non-viable material within gene banks, although I think in the last years, managers have done outstanding work to, to clear these up. But the question of whether what we have are seed morgues is not a new one. It's a question that goes back um, at least 20 years. And the question is, in a sense, do we have useful material, viable material that serves our purposes? I was motivated for this presentation in part by the kind of growing language, and many of you will be more attuned to this than I am in my world, but about the issue of dematerialization, the question of whether, or perhaps it's not whether, but when, it might make sense to get rid of the physical seeds and instead to focus on storing and managing digitized genomic data. And you could make an argument that although the day for that is not today, that it is conceivable at least that in the future, perhaps the relatively near future, the ability to move genes around, gene editing, um, gene manipulation of various kinds may alter the need for seed as an input into breeding. If you thought that was the case, then perhaps you might have a need in the short run to store seeds as a temporary measure, but with the possibility that over a longer time period, you might want to um, you might want to move away from the seeds themselves into other forms of things that are easier, cheaper, and and perhaps more manageable. Um, I'm going to argue against that proposition. So I see one objection already in the chat. So just to be clear, where I'm going, I'm going to argue against that. I'm going to argue that certainly in the short to medium term seeds are going to continue to be valuable for their uses in breeding and research. And those of you who are in the science of, of plant breeding or in related sciences will understand better than I do the limitations, the practical limitations that still apply to the, the kind of theoretical idea that you could use dematerialized um, genetic sequences rather than the seeds themselves. But I wanna argue that even in the much longer run, the kind of timeframes that we should be thinking about with gene banks, the century or multiple centuries, that we need to be keeping seeds for that very long term because apart from their uses in breeding in the ways that we understand today and in science as we currently understand it, the physical seeds themselves contain an enormous amount of what I'm gonna describe here as potential metadata that goes beyond the DNA sequences themselves. Um, you're gonna run into here my very limited scientific background, but I'm thinking, for instance, about the seed chemical and physical properties beyond the DNA itself, the, the qualities of the seed case, the, the medium of the DNA, if you like. And I wanna argue that seeds, that the physical seeds, again, as opposed to the DNA that they contain, may be valuable for purposes that we can't fully anticipate today. I'm gonna to argue this by analogy to some examples that I'm gonna pull out from other scientific collections, um, from libraries, and in fact, from archeology, span that the, the value of leaving things 
in place, in a sense, is a value, it's a form of option value that we ought to be taking advantage of and we ought to be investing in. Beyond that, I'm gonna argue that long-term storage is not especially costly and that long-term, but there is an implication, I think potentially for how we understand long-term management strategies that may eventually differ from today's practices. In other words, if we're gonna shift from at some point from seeing seeds as a necessary and immediate input into plant breeding programs, but thinking of them as, as elements of scientific collections with broader ranges of values, we may want to rethink at some stage in the future, the management strategies to emphasize and prioritize these alternative yet unknown uses. So um, with apologies to Shakespeare, I'll give away where I'm go coming from. You know, Mark Antony says in Julius Caesar, I come to bury Caesar not to praise him. I come to bury seeds, possibly in Svalbard, and, and also to praise them. So that's my terrible um, pun to start off. And, and I am gonna argue, I think that the kind of long-term storage for future generations, future centuries, is something that we really need to be keeping in the mix of our thinking about gene banks, along with their role in immediate present day breeding programs. Certainly the gene banks offer incredibly useful resources for breeding. I don't want to minimize that, but these other long-term far future uses yet unknown are an important source of value and are something that we need to manage for. So um, that's my introduction. You've now got basically the whole of the argument. If you wanna sign off now, you won't be missing a ton, but let me, let me just carry on from here. So let me start just by summarizing arguments that for this audience, are, I won't spend much time on. Simply making the case that I recognize and acknowledge the importance the evident importance of seeds as a productive input into agricultural research. I think at this point, the notion of seeds and the broader category of genetic resources as having value for agricultural innovation, this is, this is so well documented at this point that it should be beyond discussion. The other link from agricultural innovation to productivity growth and economic well being is also, I think, at this point sufficiently well-documented that we shouldn't need to spend much time on it, and, and I won't today. It's true, of course, that plant breeding depends fundamentally on the availability and the accessibility of, of useful genes. And for the time being, those useful genes reside in seeds. Seeds are the most useful form in which to store and exchange and manipulate um, genes for plant breeding. I want to think beyond that, though, and to acknowledge, again, of the many other potential reasons that we should be thinking about storing seeds. I want to acknowledge the important role of seed stores, gene banks in particular, as a form of insurance against multiple bad things that can happen in the world, the, and, and at various levels. So I want to think about the gene banks as insurance against the loss of genetic material in C2 in agricultural systems. We know that there is a steady, a steady drumbeat of the narrowing of diversity in some of the centers of diversity as, um, as farmers shift from land race materials and other traditional planting materials into, into newer and more productive varieties. So the seed banks obviously represent a kind of insurance against that. Insurance, and I think particularly in a pandemic year, the insurance against biotic stresses um, is something we need to take seriously. The, 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 the world that we grow crops in today is not the world we're gonna be living in in a decade. And you might think of these resources as providing an enormously valuable source of insurance against future shocks and against future shocks not associated with biotic stresses against catastrophic losses of genetic material through natural disasters, through floods, through, um, through destruction, through war, through conflict. I'm not gonna dwell on these issues because again, I think for this audience, it's, it should be unnecessary. 
But I'll push a little bit on the other side and say simply that gene banks are expensive. The main costs of operating gene banks are, um, you know, you can, you'll know these again better than I do, especially those of you involved in the management of banks, but collection, cleaning, cataloging, the capital costs, which are a large share of expenses, energy costs, the staff costs associated with managing collections, and then the, the very fiddly, dodgy um, act of regenerating and multiplying materials. Um, I'm thinking now of seeds rather than other types of materials, but, and then costs associated with distribution and documentation. So um, I tried working with a couple of, very informally with a couple of colleagues um, to think through what the global budget for gene banks might be and um, including material from the USDA system and other national systems we came up with an estimate that was on the order perhaps of, of hundreds of millions of dollars. Expensive, um, Victor asks in the Q&A, expensive compared to what? Always a valid question. Um, and and I'm, again, I'm, not, I'm just gonna say that in, this, in a time when budgets are tight, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna be making an economic argument um, that this is too costly for us to, to commit to but just to acknowledge that these are expensive activities. Uh, they're also increasingly, and again, many of you will be more familiar with this than I am, but these are um, increasingly complicated legal and political uh, operations. The ownership and control of genetic resources has a whole range of sensitivities attached to it. Um, and so you could, again, imagine that this creates an argument for being, you know, for, an acknowledgement or a recognition at least that the collection and storage and maintenance of collections is not a simple matter. Um, let me just leave it at that for the minute. Um, I have another question I see from, from Brian in the Q&A. Um, do, my, do my comments apply even more strongly to clonally propagated materials? I, I think everything I'm saying here applies much beyond seeds. The embarrassing, the embarrassing truth is that the desire for a catchy title led me to, Yanni pushed me to have something that would be a bit of clickbait. And so I talked about seeds, but I think in principle, everything I'm saying today would apply equally to, um, to clonally propagated material, to tissue samples, to other, to other forms of stored genetic resources. And so I, I think that's true, although you can, you can let me know by the end if I've got that wrong. I am an economist and so I, I had to put a little section of some economic thinking about this in the presentation, but it's also not something I'm gonna spend much time on. I would just say there's a big literature going back now, um, probably 30 to 35 years on the economics of genetic resources. There's a literature on the benefits of genetic diversity uh, literature on the uses of genetic resources for R&D. There's literature on property rights regimes. What we don't have much on is guidance on the, on the specifics of what to conserve or how to conserve it. So this literature tends to tell us that it makes sense to conserve genetic resources, but it doesn't really tell us how you would think about the question of when to, st when to store seeds, when to store just DNA sequences, when to store, doesn't really tell us much about storing in C2 versus X C2. So this literature is, is not giving us a lot of practical advice on these questions. And yet the kind of questions that economists might be able to feed in on would be how to allocate scarce funding across potentially vast needs for conservation. And maybe to make some headway on some of the big questions around what to collect, how exactly to conserve it, how to manage, how to finance. And I just say at the moment, I think these are at this level of detail, the literature has been fairly silent. I'm gonna zoom in here for today on my question in a sense of how to conserve and the question of do we still need to conserve seeds and how is that changing perhaps as, as the tools of bioscience advance 
can we think about moving to other forms of dematerialized conservation that might be cheaper, where data is more easily shared. It's, you can send the sequence with a click rather than having to multiply seeds, deal with phytosanitary restrictions and mail them off to collaborators. A system that would be less reliant on physical reproduction and regeneration might be less subject to genetic drift and some of the other concerns that arise. And you could imagine perhaps a world in which you could maintain smaller physical collections of seeds that could be used for characterization and evaluation. Suppose you wanted to, you know, if you had a small working collection that in some sense you believed spanned the essential genetic diversity, you might be able to use that for conducting evaluation and characterization exercises to identify genes that you could then search for in the, in the stored strings of data. Um, so I, I hang that question here. It's the question I want to come back to. And I'm, as I say, I'm, I'm going to come down on the side very strongly of arguing for the collection, continued collection, continued conservation, continued management of collections of seeds as physical entities. So I wanna raise the possibility of a shift in the way we do things, but I, I want to defend strongly the, the current gene banks and their content of physical seeds, their continued storage of physical seeds. I don't think we want, I, well, let me proceed. I don't think we want to, I don't think we want a future in which we've gotten rid of the physical seeds and just kept strings of data. And let me make a couple of arguments. As I said, my arguments are gonna be by, I'm gonna invoke a series of analogies. Argument by analogy is always a bit dangerous. I wanna start with one of the older analogies that's been used in thinking about gene banks, which is the analogy of libraries. And I attribute this to, I think Gardner Brown back in the 90s, the early 90s, um, it's the first person I associate with this particular analogy. Um, he argued that you could think of gene banks as a kind of library. And um, there's a nice piece of actually a brief written by Ban Wu Ku and Melinda Smale back in 2003 as a policy brief for, for IFBRI and IPCRI, in which they point out, they say, it's not hard to assign values to the books we've already read in the library. The question that libraries wrestle with is about the books that haven't been taken out. You know, there, and the argument that librarians would make, I think, and I think we should accept this, is that you shouldn't necessarily throw out a book from the library because nobody's taken it out in the past 10 years. The challenge is to identify which books you should keep. If you have a limited storage space, you might not be able to keep everything. Maybe you should think about reducing duplicates. On the other hand, maybe the books that you have duplicates of are books that are particularly worthwhile to have duplicates of. And so you might thin out collections in certain subject areas, but this idea that you want to maintain collections that span, that include materials that you don't currently see in use, I think is a fundamental, a fundamental argument that we have and that we've documented pretty effectively with gene banks. Often the materials that aren't directly used are still valuable sources of information and we can glean information from them. We, we can turn to them when we want to, even if they're not actually used in breeding itself. I think the question that, that Gardner Brown didn't wrestle with himself, but that has become incredibly salient in the library world in the time since 1991, is how do our library collection and maintenance strategies change as the, with the arrival of new technologies? When old books have been digitized, is there still the same argument for keeping the hard copies that aren't in use? Digital copies, after all, make search easier. They can be accessed simultaneously by multiple users. Maybe you keep some hard copies as backups 
and maybe hard copies are convenient for certain kinds of uses, but do you still need the physical books in the physical library at a point where the books have become digitized? So I don't know if you can see this very well. This is from my own, my home institution. This is a link or a screenshot of the digital Bodleian, the Bodleian Library at Oxford being having an extraordinary, um, an extraordinary physical resource. And uh, they have, in addition to being a sort of standard library portal for the books that are widely used, as you can perhaps read down here, they have over a million images from rare books and manuscripts and others of the treasures of the Bodleian. So again, it's a way to make a ton of material available very widely. And uh, just again, for to entertain, here's a screenshot of a, an open page from Newton's Principia, um, you know, the, the kind of founding book of modern maths, if you like. And this kind of material is, is in the library, it's held in the library. And so you can see it digitized in this form as an image of the book itself. But you can also find increasingly, don't know how good your Latin is, but you can find the text of the Principia simply as a text string. And I guess the question I wanna ask is, to what extent do we wanna think of the text version as a substitute for the hard copy? I would argue that they're not very close substitutes. You could ask, is there a reason beyond sentiment or collector's value to keep a first edition of the Principia? Um, it's valuable because it's old and it's rare and, it, and it's kind of cool, but is it still something you want to have? And how should you think about the value in a world where the digitization has taken place? Is there still, let's say a scientific value to keeping the original book. One of the really interesting things that my library colleagues tell me that's now being done with some old manuscripts, some old books of this kind, is that the marks and imperfections and all kinds of other traces that, that you can find traces in some cases on old books, on the pages and on the covers of DNA from people who've handled the books. You can find um, lots of stuff beyond the text strings of the words that Newton wrote. And you can find marginal scribbles. There's a manuscript version of Handel's Messiah, his original score that the Bodleian has on display. And you can see Handel's notation. There's material, there's information that's lost when all you have is the text string. Some of what we might want to look at in the future in these books is not the text strings of the content, it's the physical object itself, which has information, different information. It's not, it's not the same information as the text string that the book contains. It's additional information of the history of who's used the book, over what period of time, how have people interacted with these objects. And the book as a physical object has value that's different, I would argue, from the book as a text string. And I think there's an analogy here to the world of seeds that's also gonna be increasingly important as the tools, the scientific tools we bring to bear get stronger and richer. Um, the seed itself as a container for DNA is something we shouldn't ignore. The, the physical and chemical traces, and again, you'll have to bear with me because my science is, is weak, but the physical and chemical traces that we can find in the seed above and beyond the genetic coding is potentially interesting and important. That has, that leads me to my second set of analogies. And this is a broad set of analogies from what 
you might think of or describe as scientific collections. And here I think the lesson is that scientific collections, and by this I mean the many other kinds of collections beyond gene banks, collections of medical specimens, geological samples, um, herbarium records, often turn out to have uses beyond those that they were originally intended for. And there's some great evidence that's been compiled recently um, to show some of the ways in which these collections have turned out to have uses beyond their original purpose. One that probably many in this audience will be familiar with is the use of herbarium records, which along with the specimens themselves have information about the time and date and location where they were collected. That information in turn has allowed people to understand better long-term climate changes by understanding what was flowering in what locations, in what points in time. And I think the lesson here from the scientific collections is in a sense that if you build it, they will come to quote another, another uh, a movie reference that may not be familiar to all of you. Or if you think of it this way, if you collect it, scientists and researchers in the future are very likely to find uses for it that you didn't expect. If you're interested in reading more about this, the Smithsonian Institution in the last year or two, um, led by a study by David Schindel on behalf of the Smithsonian, documented some really interesting examples of the ways in which geological uh, samples, core samples, were used for purposes far different from what they were originally um, conceived of. And um, the, the seeds, seeds themselves, like the materials in these collections, are going to turn out to have value beyond what we currently expect. Let me pause. I see a couple of questions that have popped up. Um, I, see, I see a long one from, from Carrie Fowler. So maybe um, better to have you post, pose that out loud if Luigi can unmute them. Carrie, would you like to read your, um, or, or um, out loud, just read your, your question, pose your question to Doug? Oh, sure, and, and thanks, Doug. This is, this is a great uh, seminar you're giving. Um, I guess my question is really a comment is that for, um, and this will be no surprise to Luigi, by the way, that we've, we've discussed this many times, um, for the many minor crops for which there are few, if any, um, professional plant breeders, um, obviously, the genomic data that you can get from the internet is not going to be useful to the small farmers that are practicing the natural selection that are, that is going to be responsible for whether or not these crops adapt to something like, like climate change. Um, the real question is, um, are we going to figure out mechanisms, I think, for getting this diversity to the farmers, or, or are we going to simply say, well, for all these minor crops, Good luck. We hope the, the necessary diversity is already in the field um, because what we have in the gene banks is going to stay in the gene banks. Right. I mean, I think so, completely agree with the comment. I think, um, and to be clear, I'm the argument I'm trying to build towards here is not one for long term storage in lieu of in lieu of current uses for breeding. And so maybe I should clarify that. I wanna, I, I hope the argument that I'm gonna get across is that even though in the short run, the actual use of materials for breeding, for research, for providing, for pumping diversity back into farmers' fields, if you like, um, and, and useful traits, if not diversity, I'm, I'm certainly not questioning that short to medium term need. I think what I wanna flag is that even if you're a technological optimist and you think that in the long run, the seeds themselves may become irrelevant for this, that maybe, maybe putting useful traits into minor crops becomes such a simple and easy thing to do that it becomes a kind of um, 
a, a standard exercise, a classroom exercise for a bunch of um, biology students in, you know, in the year 2100, which is not such a, it's not such a far-fetched idea, right? Um, I've been, I've been to science museums where nine-year-olds are extracting DNA from, in, in a way that would have been inconceivable from, from uh, plant specimens in ways that would have been completely inconceivable to, you know, to um, Crick and Watson. This is the, you could imagine in a sense that there's an argument that says in the long run, we might not need all of, we might still not need seeds in 2100 to pump diversity into farmers' fields in the way that you're describing. And I want to acknowledge both that that might be correct and that that still isn't a reason for ignoring seeds or for saying that we only have a, a short-term project, that the seed storage itself only needs to get us through a few decades and then the science will take care of things beyond that. But I'm certainly not, I certainly don't intend to argue against the short and medium term, by which I mean, you know, the next half century of, of direct uses of gene bank material for breeding for major crops as well as for minor crops. I, I think seeds are still the most useful sources of genetic material in breeding. And um, so I, I hope that's clear. Uh, Doug, thank, thank you very much. I actually wasn't challenging anything you had said. I just wanted to add something and your, your elaborations are quite well taken. Thank you. Thanks, yeah, no, just wanted to make sure that my argument is, is clear enough that what I'm saying. In, in the same spirit, and I'm, I'm a little bit conscious of time here, but I think I'm okay, actually. There's another set of, I think, really interesting analogies. And here I'm, I'm completely out of my depth and borrowing heavily from a colleague at Oxford, Amy Bogard, who's been kind enough to take time to, to exchange a few emails with me. I think there's a great lesson from archeology span on the need for intellectual humility when we think about um, how we store things. I gather that within archeology, span it's become a fairly standard practice to leave some sites that have been discovered unexcavated or to leave portions of sites unexcavated because we simply don't know what questions will be of interest in the future. We don't know what tools our successor researchers will have at their disposal. And what we do know is that well-intentioned scientists as well as some less well-intentioned archeologists in the past have destroyed material that we would now value highly. You know, the example of past archeologists looking for artifacts and throwing away the dirt um, where present day researchers are really interested in the dirt and the physical and chemical and biological properties of the dirt. There's a great example that Amy pointed me to in the site of Hattusha in Turkey, which is um, a Bronze Age capital of the Hittite Empire. And um, in the early 1990s, researchers from the German Archaeological Institute uncovered underground silos with hundreds of tons of intact carbonized grain. And they sampled this but they left most of it in situ. So it's still sitting there um, for future generations to explore. One of the things that they were able, to, that Amy and her team were able to do was to look at chemical profiles and at the prevalence of specific weed seeds from the samples. There were, as I understand it, multiple underground chambers, 30 or 32 underground chambers with distinct, with distinct material in them. And they were able to document from the chemical and biological mixes that they found that the grain must have come from different communities, which made sense in terms of thinking about tribute paid from different locations that were under the rule of the Hittites. And so that's answered a set of questions of real interest today, trying to understand something about the trade relationships, the political relationships, but also about the biological basis of 
of the empire. Um, to give you a sense, these are some images from the excavation. Um, wheat kernels mixed with weed seeds, some barley kernels, and then two types of weed seeds that they found in different, in different quantities in different locations. Um, so I think the, the point to make out of this piece of the analogy is, you know, again, that our understanding of what the purpose and direction of the science is will itself shift over time. Earlier archeologists were interested in, in finding gold or artifacts or answering questions about the fall of Troy um, that they had been inspired to think were important from, from, reading, from reading the Greek classics. Today's archeologists are asking a very different set of questions about climate change or about um, historical patterns of human migration. And the tools have shifted, the science has changed, but the questions have also changed. And I think this is something we need to be conscious of as we look, again, as we look at a scientific collection, the seed banks themselves are going to be valuable resources for scientists in the future, asking questions that we haven't yet thought of and using tools that we're not yet aware of. There's not, there's a temptation, I think, to imagine that now that we've cracked a bunch of the, now that we can do genomics, we've reached the end of science in some way. And, and this is, you know, if we were to capture the strings of the DNA code for an individual seed, that we've therefore somehow extracted all the information that we might ever want from it. And surely that's not correct. So um, let, me, let me move on to my conclusion. I see a couple more questions in the Q&A, but maybe since I'm relatively close to the end of my, my presentation, I'll leave those for a couple of minutes for the open Q&A. So I don't have much more to say that you haven't already heard. So I'm just gonna be repeating myself. I think that the purpose of gene banks is to conserve genes for future uses, but that's only the beginning. There are other uses that we can't yet fully anticipate. And that also reminds us that the current uses of genes and seeds and other, and, and to be sure, other genetic resource materials in crop improvement programs and contemporary crop improvement programs is only a subset of the value of these collections. And so we need, we need to be thinking hard about what, how we weigh these values of things over much longer time horizons and much more uncertainty about the direction of science and the direction of our knowledge. This option value, and it is, to economists, this is a real tangible value. I'm not talking about something that is, um, we talk sometimes about existence values, the, the satisfaction we get from knowing that these collections are there. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about future use values that we don't fully understand today. And those are tangible. They're difficult to quantify, but they're important. And so I'm gonna argue that those values are sufficient that we should be thinking hard about even when, even when and if the technology arrives such that the seeds themselves are not essential for crop improvement programs, they're still gonna be valuable for a set of potential future uses. I wanna come back to my I, I used a line early in the talk about seeds as, as metadata. I think among the things we know already are that the value of collections is increased when the collections are complemented with information. Information about the materials that we have in collections allows for more focused searches, better under, um, for, for more efficient use of the materials themselves. At the moment, we collect a bunch of information, passport data, characterization and evaluation data, and so forth. 
I think we could also conceptualize the seeds themselves as a type of metadata. They have the, the medium, and again, forgive me if my terminology isn't satisfactory here, but the seed as a medium for the DNA that it contains is a form of metadata with potentially a lot of information contained within it. So I get to my first kind of, and it's a question rather than an answer, but I think it raises a question of whether we should, whether we should or can or could change the way we collect or handle or store materials to maximize the value of the metadata along with the genetic information itself. Um, I, don't, I don't know exactly what that means to be clear, but I think it means, for instance, I'm, and I'm thinking aloud, those of you who actually deal with managing seeds in gene banks and other materials will probably object, but I wonder whether we may wanna think hard about maintaining where it's possible um, the original seed as distinct from the regrown and regenerated material. In other words, there may be valuable information about the soils in which the seeds were initially grown um, or the, the um, you know, there may be trace elements or physical or chemical properties in the, in the originally collected material that's distinct from the genetic information that's that's still there in material that's been regrown multiple times. And so I pose this as a question at least. Ought we to be thinking about making sure that we retain more of the value of the medium of the originally collected material? And I don't know what the current state of play is on this. I don't know how this is managed in practice or how feasible it would be to prioritize that. Um, I do have to offer a couple of observations from, um, you know, from the basic economics. There's always going to be an argument to avoid duplication and, um, and the potential for redundancy in large collections is there. We want to conserve what's relatively rare. We want to conserve what's valuable. The challenge is we just don't always know what's there. How close is the future? And I think this is another question that's got real management implications for gene banks. What is the time frame, as though we could know it, at which scientists might be able to work usefully with dematerialized DNA? It's not here now. It's it's not. I don't see it as being a technique that's that's of value. As Kerry pointed out, certainly not going to be the case for minor crops for some time. So, what's the time frame at which the immediate uses of gene banks for feeding into breeding programs become secondary? My hunch is that this is going to be one of these elements of science where the where, as I put down at the bottom of the slide, the horizon recedes that the gap between what is technically feasible and what is economically practical from a research standpoint. You know, what is it that breeders are gonna to wanna to work with? I think it's gonna be quite a long time before you're gonna see um, outside of the advanced labs in, in scientifically advanced countries, um, I think it's gonna be a long time before you see local breeders trying to develop locally adapted varieties for um, remote rural areas in Sub-Saharan Africa using anything other than seeds for their breeding purposes. I think this isn't gonna be as straightforward. I also think there's lots of, you know, it turns out that the complexity of traits and moving gene complexes is, is problematic. So my hunch is that the future is not as close as it seems and that it's likely to recede as we get as, as we move forward. Um, I have some favorite examples of this that I could come back to if necessary. And so let me just finally wrap up and say, I think um, 
I hope I've made an argument here that absolutely accepts the goal of conservation of genetic resources is important itself. The economics of conservation, I think, is a great field. I keep trying to persuade young researchers to go into this as an area of research. I do think that there's some reason for people in the policy world uh, working with gene banks to reevaluate conservation strategies and to think about um, the ways in which the shifting uses of the shifting future uses of seeds and gene banks might change what we do and how we manage today. I'm sure those conversations take place in every gene bank and on the gene bank platform. Um, so I, I'm confident those are conversations that are taking place. I think they're really important conversations. And um, I think at the risk of delving into CGIAR business that is not my, I'm, I'm not currently connected to, I think the idea that the gene banks should be conceived primarily as serving a contemporary role in breeding programs is probably short-sighted. Um, I think we need to retain an understanding of the gene banks as having this long-term value for, for not just future generations, but for future centuries. Um, and so I come to my final line, which is simply keep the seeds. I think the seeds are going to retain value. They're gonna have values we haven't yet understood. And, um, and, and so my answer to the question, who needs seeds is, is that we do. So let me stop there and, and handle some questions. I see a number of questions in the Q&A. Um, let me pick off a few of these. And uh, Yanni or Luigi, do you want me just to, to kind of pick my own or should I open things up? How do you want to handle this? Uh, I think in the order that they are would be a good way to handle it. All right. Nicola uh, Rowe at the top, I think, is a, has a good question. Great. Um, so the limit in the analogy between gene banks and libraries, seeds and books, um, analogies are analogies. And I agree with you completely. We can only take it so far. I, I think of this more as, um, you know, again, my point in the analogy is not that, is that the physical objects, th there may be some books for which the text string is a reasonable substitute. But there probably are some books where that's not a reasonable substitute at all. And where there's value in the physical book and the information it contains, again, the book is a, the book is metadata for the, for the text. Um, and I think this is certainly something that applies to seeds, but I agree with you completely that the the broader analogy between library books and seeds is a completely inadequate one. Um, so uh, guilty as charged. From from Charlotte's Charlotte asks the question: Are these unanticipated values distinct from option values? And um, no, I think these are precisely a form of option value. So it's an option value, it's a future use value. And these are present day option values. In other words, keeping the seeds, we keep them because of the option value that they give for a future use. So I think it's, I'd think of these as a subset of the option values of, of the collection. Um, Jeffrey asks, um, how real, this is a great question. How realistic would it be to seek funding and other support from a wider range of sources. And um, I, don't, I don't know. I, there's certainly, it would be interesting, it would be interesting to think about approaching um, some foundations or other funders with this in mind. I think there's a worry here that because there's an existing structure that the it's easy for others in the broader donor and philanthropic community to identify, to say, well, this is just an agriculture thing. The seeds are there, they're used 
uh, the, the crop trust and the CGIR have this. Um, and so I think that becomes a strategic issue around fundraising, but it would be really interesting to connect with other scientists and other scientific collections that wrestle with these questions all the time. Um, I think one of the really interesting pieces that, this, that the Smithsonian Institution report that I mentioned is dealing with is the recognition that lots of scientific collections are wrestling with the same funding issues. Donors don't like to fund these collections. They see them as they, you know, they're collections, and collections don't seem collections don't seem sexy. And saying I'm holding on to this thing because it might be valuable someday is a terrible pitch to make to a donor. And so the the Smithsonian study was precisely designed to speak to that concern that in many cases you've got you know warehouses full of stuff with no obvious immediate use, but are you really gonna get rid of it because you don't know what you're gonna do with it? And so I think that question becomes, becomes a meaningful one. Um, Victor asks, rather than speculating when the incredibly efficient technology called seed will become redundant, I'm with you there. Um, how about looking at how to better connect conservation with seed systems research and with the future of traits. I, um, I would agree completely on the need for better seed systems research. And I think, but I see that as a, so I accept that too, but just want to acknowledge that as a kind of orthogonal argument. I think understanding better, it goes a little bit to Carrie's point earlier that I think we need to pay a lot more attention to how seeds and how diversity from the gene banks flows into farmers fields, which is certainly about understanding seed systems, adaptive breeding, indigenous breeding, um, farmer management of seeds and seed systems, a whole complex of issues around, um, around the uses of diversity by farmers themselves. So I'm, I'm fully supportive of that as a research agenda and as an agenda, not just for research, but for, for the agricultural community to pursue. Um, so agree completely. It's not quite what I wanted to focus on today, but I, I, I'd like to think that we can do more than one thing. So I, I absolutely support that. Um, I'm just gonna keep going, Annie, is that okay? That's fine, yeah, we have time, we have about, three, four more minutes. So Great. as long as your voice is still there, we're still here with you. Well, it's, it's given out, but um, as long as you can still understand me. Um, Norbert asks, who deposits seed at a gene, seeds at a gene bank? Um, others, on this, others on this webinar can undoubtedly give a better answer than I can. Um, I, so I'm gonna invoke here, um, a non-seed example from the USDA National Animal Gene Bank, where I, my understanding from colleagues is that there's quite a lot of commercial material that's being put into the gene bank. Um, some, of the, some of the breed associations are storing genes in the gene bank and with admittedly with some restrictions on the uses of it. But I think there is, an increasing recognition in the, this may be hopelessly naive and optimistic, but I think there's an increasing recognition in the commercial, um, in, in commercial bioscience field of the public good value of, of gene banks. Um, certainly they are primarily um, importers of material from the gene bank rather than exporters to the gene banks. But I think there's a recognition that um, storing material is, is worthwhile and that paying for storage. So I think there's been some efforts in, in several countries to mobilize the commercial seed sector or the commercial animal agriculture sector to contribute towards the cost of, of maintaining gene banks. So I'm, I may be, again, on the naive and, and optimistic side of this, but I think there are reasons to feel hopeful 
about um, a, and so yes, obviously I think there's a limit on what materials being put in and under what terms, but I, I don't think that means that we're only gonna see, that we're not gonna see commercially useful material there. A um, Couple of others. How are one from Noel Anglin, since you're an economist, perhaps you can tackle that one. Has anyone compared research costs, breeding costs versus gene bank costs? Ah. Um, So I'm going to answer my interpretation of the question. So I think um, I'm going to interpret this as a question about the, who has a comparative advantage in pre-breeding, right? That if I think, I, I think, and tell me if I'm wrong, Noel, um, but if you think of where, so breeders can access, they can often find improved materials in their in their advanced lines and in breeding collections where they can and increasingly with, with um, genomic selection, breeders may be able to do this quite well and quite efficiently. In which case, digging into gene banks for material that comes attached to, for useful traits that come attached to um, disadvantageous traits ends up being very costly. In the past, the response of gene banks has often been to do a bunch of pre-breeding and to identify and to, in a sense, to isolate the traits that breeders are gonna find useful and to put them in as at least a semi-improved form to reduce the cost to breeders of pulling in the material. So who has the comparative advantage in doing that? You know, that I think is, that's a really complicated question that probably is crop specific. Um, and, and depends also on how well the gene banks themselves can anticipate or identify the traits that the breeders are gonna to want to use. So I think that too becomes, in other words, is this a supply driven activity from the gene bank side or demand driven activity from the breeder side? Often what happens is the breeders exhaust the materials that they have at hand and turn to the gene bank when they need something that they can't find. And so I don't think that's an either or scenario I think that's a very much a collaborative, that, that ought to be a collaborative arrangement. Um, there so, are a few other ones, but um, I think we've reached the end of our hour and I think your voice is at the point where uh, you may need to have a rest. So on behalf of everybody, Douglas, thank you so much for preparing this talk and giving us this very open view with archeology span and literature to come in and. Uh, and, and, and sort of shake our way of thinking. Uh, to everybody else, thank you for logging on uh, and thank you for participating as you did with the questions. Douglas has a very easy website to um, access. His email is very available. If any of you, the few that we have that we were not able to answer or address your comments, please do uh, address anything to him. He's willing to answer as he had previously said, any questions or comments that have been uh, sent. Um, thank you very much, everybody. Have a great rest of the day, and we'll hope to see you next month in the next Go webinar. Thank you so much, Jenny. I would just say I meant I failed in one of the things you asked of me, which was to put my my email address on the final slide. I did just enter it in the chat window. So okay, so it's there if anybody wants to address any other comments. Also, if you Google him, he's very easy to find. He's got his email there. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Take care, everybody. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you, Doug. Thank yeah, you. Thanks, Doug. That was really good. Thanks, everyone.